Hey friends, ready to continue reading our drama of Anne Frank? As a reminder, so far, the play opened with Otto Frank, who's Anne's father, discovering her diary in an abandoned annex. Um, then he starts to read her diary, and he's really surprised to find it, and it sort of flashes us back in time. So we are actually getting to see some of the things that Anne wrote in her diary and things that actually happened in the annex. Right now we're looking at the Franks and the Van Dans just starting to move into the annex. Um, you have Margot Anne, like her sister and their parents, and then you have the Van Dans and their 16 year old son, Peter, living in a very confined space and they're just starting to get comfortable. Meep and Mr. Crawler are their helpers. They are going to be sneaking them food, um, supplies, and carrying messages to the outside world for them. It's a really big risk. If Meep or Mr. Crawler get caught, they could also be sent to labor camps um, or to death camps. So scary stuff, they're really brave. So we left off right with Mr. Crawler reminding Mr. Frank to tell them the rules about the noise because their annex is right behind the workroom on uh, the offices. If the families make any noise at all, they could get found out and they could get caught. Um, and then that would be the end of everything. Another reminder, they don't know how long they are going into hiding for. They don't know if this is going to be for a month or two or if this could be for longer. Um, they don't have an end date, right, when they're living it. All right, let's continue where we left off. Here we go. Oh, uh, right you here. tell them about the noise? I'll tell them. Goodbye, then, for the moment. I'll come up again after the workmen leave. Workmen leave. Goodbye, Mr. Crawler. How can we thank you? I never thought I'd live to see the day when a man like Mr. Frank would have to go into hiding. When you think he breaks off going out, Mr. Frank follows him down the steps, bolting the door after him. In the interval before he returns, Peter goes over to Marco, shaking hands with her. As Mr. Frank comes back up the steps, Mrs. Frank questions him anxiously. What did he mean about the noise? First, let us take off some of these clothes. They all start to take off garment after garment. On each of their coats, sweaters, blouses, suits, dresses, is another yellow star of David. Mr. and Mrs. Frank are underdressed quite simply. The others wear several things, sweaters, extra dresses, bathrobes, aprons, nightgowns, etc. Holy moly, why are they all taking off all these layers of clothing? So as a reminder, they could not pack suitcases. They had to leave in a big hurry. But the reason they couldn't pack suitcases is because it would look very suspicious. So most of their clothing that they're wearing um, or that they left with their like on their backs is what they're going to have to live with for the rest of the time that they're in hiding. So even though it's July, they're having to wear their like winter pajamas. Um, even though it's like, you know, July, they're having to wear all these different layers if they want to have an apron with them, if they want to have a dress with them or more than one coat with them. So they're starting to um, remove that clothing that they're going to have. So just the clothes on their backs. Um, and here we pick go with Mr. Van Damme. It's a wonder we weren't arrested walking along the streets. Petronella with a fur coat in July and that cat of Peter's crying all the way. As she is removing a pair of panties. Oh no. A cat? On, oh, please. It's all right. I've got on three more. <laughs> she pulls off two more. Finally, as they have all removed their surplus clothes, they look to Mr. Frank. She had a lot of underwear. To speak. I mean, I wouldn't just want to wear one pair of underwear. Like, could you imagine being in hiding for two years? I mean, seriously. So we're glad that she has more. <laughs> okay, so now let's hear about the noise. Now, about the noise. While the men are in the building below, we must have complete quiet. Every sound can be heard down there, not only in the workrooms, but in the offices too. The men come at about 8.30 and leave at about 5.30. So, to be perfectly safe, from 8 in the morning until 6 in the evening, we must move only when it is necessary, and then in stockinged feet. Socks we must not speak above a whisper. We must not run any water. We cannot use the sink, or even, forgive me, the WC. The, bathroom. the pipes go down through the workrooms. 
it would be heard. No trash. Mr. Frank stops abruptly as he hears the sound of marching feet from the street below. Everyone is motionless, paralyzed with fear. Mr. Frank goes quietly into the room on the right to look down out of the window. Ahn runs after him, peering out with him. The tramping feet pass without stopping. Whew. The tension is relieved. Mr. Frank, followed by Ahn, returns to the main room and resumes his instructions to the group. No trash must ever be thrown out which might reveal that someone is living up here. Not even a potato paring. We must burn everything in the stove at night. This is the way we must live, until it is over, if we are to survive. Wow, those are some strict rules. Um, even now, they just hear marching from the soldiers outside, and everybody is really like on alert. There's a lot of tension because they're really nervous. They cannot flush their toilet during the day even, because there can't be any like sounds, not even any pipe sounds. Until it is over. After six, we can move about. We can talk and laugh and have our supper and read and play games, just as we would at home. And now I think it would be wise if we all went to our rooms and were settled before eight o'clock. Mrs. Van Dan, you and your husband will be upstairs. I regret that there's no place up there for Peter, but he will be here near us. This will be our common room, where we'll meet to talk and eat and read, like one family. And where do you and Mrs. Frank sleep? This room is also our bedroom. That isn't right. Uh, we'll sleep here and you take the room upstairs. Please, I've thought this out for weeks. It's the best arrangement, the only arrangement. Never, never can we thank you. I don't know what would have happened to us if it hadn't been for Mr. Frank. You don't know how your husband helped me when I came to this country, knowing no one, not able to speak the language. I can never repay him for that. May I help you with your things? So this is an important moment um, in signpost language, as in like something that stands out to us. This is called a memory moment. So Mr. Frank is having this moment where he remembers what Mr. Von Don or Van Dan did for them. Um, so he helped them when they originally moved from Germany to Amsterdam. So Mr. Frank felt like he really owed the Van Dans. No, no. Come along, Lydia. You'll be all right, Peter? You're not afraid? Please, Mother. They start up the stairs to the attic room above. Mr. Frank turns to Mrs. Frank. You too must have some rest, Edith. You didn't close your eyes last night, nor you, Marco. I slept, Father. Wasn't that funny? I knew it was the last night in my own bed, and yet I slept soundly. I'm glad, Don. Now you'll be able to help me straighten things in here. Come with me. You and Marco rest in this room for the time being. He picks up their clothes, starting for the room on the right. You're sure? I could help, and... Anne hasn't had her milk. I'll give it to her. Anne, Peter, it's best that you take off your shoes now, before you forget. He leads the way to the room, followed by Marco. You're sure you're not tired, Anne? I feel fine. I'm going to help Father. Peter, I'm glad you are to be with us. Yes, Mrs. Frank. Mrs. Frank goes to join Mr. Frank and Marco. During the following scene, Mr. Frank helps Margo and Mrs. Frank to hang up their clothes. Then he persuades them both to lie down and rest. The Vandans in their room above settle themselves. In the main room, Anne and Peter remove their shoes. Peter takes his cat out of the carrier. What's your cat's name? Mushi. Mushi, Mushi, Mushi. I love cats. I have one. A darling little cat, but they made me leave her behind. I left some food and a note for the neighbors to take care of her. I'm going to miss her terribly. What is yours, a him or a her? He's a Tom. He doesn't like strangers. He takes the cat from her, 
putting it back in its carrier. Then I'll have to stop being a stranger, won't I? Is he fixed? Huh? Did you have him fixed? Awkward. No. Oh, you ought to have him fixed. To keep him from, you know, fighting. Where did you go to school? Just want to pause there. To keep him from fighting. Oh, Anne. Continuing on, now she's asking where he went to school. Jewish secondary. But that's where Marco and I go. I never saw you around. I used to see you. Sometimes. You did? In the schoolyard. You were always in the middle of a bunch of kids. He takes a penknife from his pocket. Why didn't you ever come over? I'm sort of a lone wolf. He starts to rip off his Star of David. Whoa, so that's the star that identifies Jewish people as being Jewish, and it's against the law to not have that star on. So this is a pretty significant act by Peter. What are you doing? Taking it off. But you can't do that. They'll arrest you if you go out without your star. He tosses his knife on the table. Who's going out? Why, of course. You're right. Of course we don't need them anymore. She ha. picks up his knife and starts to take her star off. I wonder what our friends will think when we don't show up today. I didn't have any dates with anyone. Oh, I did. I had a date with Yopi to go and play ping pong at her house. Do you know Yopi Duval? No. Yopi's my best friend. I wonder what she'll think when she telephones and there's no answer. Probably she'll go over to the house. I wonder what she'll think. We left everything as if we'd suddenly been called away. Breakfast dishes in the sink, beds not made. As she pulls off her star, the cloth underneath shows clearly the color and form of the star. Look, it's still there. Peter goes over to the stove with his star. What are you going to do with yours? Burn it. She starts to throw hers in and cannot. It's funny. I can't throw mine away. I don't know why. You can't throw something they branded you with? That they made you wear so they could spit on you? I know, I know. But after all, it is the Star of David, isn't it? In the bedroom right, Margot and Mrs. Frock are lying down. Mr. Frock starts quietly out. Maybe it's different for a girl. Yeah. Mr. Frock comes into the main room. Forgive me, Peter. Now, let me see. We must find a bed for your cat. I'm glad you brought your cat. Anne was feeling so badly about hers. Getting a used small wash tub. Here we are. Will it be comfortable in that? Thanks. And here is your room. But I warn you, Peter, you can't grow any more. <laughs> Not an inch. Or you'll have to sleep with your feet out of the skylight. Are you hungry? No. We have some bread and butter. No, thank you. You can have it for luncheon then. And tonight we will have a real supper. Our first supper together. Thanks. Thanks. He goes into his room. During the following scene, he arranges his possessions in his new room. That's a nice boy, Peter. He's awfully shy, isn't he? You like him, I know. I certainly hope so, since he's the only boy I'm likely to see for months and months. Mr. Frank sits down, taking off his shoes. Something I want you guys to notice here already is um, compare and contrasting Anne's personality and Peter's personality. Reminder that we only know about characters based on what they say and what they do. So their dialogue and their actions. So just based on what we've seen of Anne and Peter so far, um, think about how they are different. Continuing. Angela, there's a box there. That's a nickname. Will you for open him, it? For her. He indicates a carton on the couch. Don brings it to the center table. In the street below, there's the sound of children playing. You know the way I'm going to think of it here? I'm going to think of it as a boarding house. A very peculiar summer boarding house, like the one that we... She breaks off as she pulls out some photographs. Father! My movie stars! I was wondering where they were. I was looking for them this morning. 
And Queen Wilhelmina. How wonderful. There's something more. Go on. Look further. He goes over to the sink, pouring a glass of milk from a thermos bottle, pulling out a pasteboard-bound book. A diary! She throws her arms around her father. I've never had a diary, and I've always longed for one. She looks around the room. Pencil, 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 pencil. She starts down the stairs. I'm going down to the office to get a pencil. Um, no! He goes after her, catching her by the arm and pulling her back. But there's no one in the building now. It doesn't matter. I don't want you ever to go beyond that door. Whoa. Never? Not even at night time when everyone is gone? Or on Sundays? Can't I go down to listen to the radio? Never. I'm sorry, Annika. It isn't safe. No, you must never go beyond that door. Oof. For the first time, Anne realizes what going into hiding means. I see. It will be hard, I know. But always remember this, Sanika. There are no walls, there are no bolts, no locks that anyone can put on your mind. Meep will bring us books. We will read history, poetry, mythology. He gives her the glass of milk. Here's your milk. With his arm about her, they go over to the couch, sitting down side by side. As a matter of fact, between us, Anne, being here has certain advantages for you. For instance, you remember the battle you had with your mother the other day on the subject of overshoes? You said you'd rather die than wear overshoes, but in the end you had to wear them? Well, now, you see, for as long as we are here, you will never have to wear overshoes. <laughs> Isn't that good? And the coat that you inherited from Marco, you won't have to wear that anymore. And the piano. You won't have to practice on the piano. I tell you, this is going to be a fine life for you. So this is a signpost known as words for the wiser, words from the wiser. So we are having a wiser character talking to our like protagonist, our main character. Even though this is a true story, we're still going to view this like it's uh, like it's fiction since it's a play. So um, he, what's cool is he knows all this stuff about her, about how much she hates piano. Um, and the, he, she hates the coat from Margot. Um, so he's doing what he he's using what he knows about her to help comfort her. Anne's panic is gone. Peter appears in the doorway of his room with a saucer in his hand. He is carrying his cat. I, I, I thought I'd better get some water for Mushi before. Of course. As he starts toward the sink, the carillon begins Bell. to chime the hour of eight. He tiptoes to the window at the back and looks down at the street below. He turns to Peter, indicating in pantomime that it is too late. Stop, stop, stop. Peter starts back for his room. He steps on a creaking board. The three of them are frozen for a minute, in fear. As Peter starts away again, Anne tiptoes over to him and pours some of the milk from her glass into the saucer for the cat. Aww. Peter squats on the floor, putting the milk before the cat. Mr. Frank gives Anne his fountain pen and then goes into the room at the right. For a second, Anne watches the cat. Then she goes over to the center table and opens her diary. In the room at the right, Mrs. Frank has sat up quickly at the sound of the carillon. Mr. Frank comes in and sits down beside her on the settee, his arm comfortingly around her. Upstairs, in the attic room, Mr. and Mrs. Van Don have hung their clothes in the closet and are now seated on the iron bed. Mrs. Van Don leans back, exhausted. Mr. Van Don fans her with a newspaper. Anne starts to write in her diary. The lights dim out. The curtain falls. In the darkness, Anne's voice comes to us again, faintly at first, and then with growing strength. 
So this is going to be from her diary. Um, she's reading it out as she's writing it. I expect I should be describing what it feels like to go into hiding, but I really don't know yet myself. I only know it's funny never to be able to go outdoors, never to breathe fresh air, never to run and shout and jump. It's the silence in the nights that frightens me most. Every time I hear a creak in the house or a step on the street outside, I'm sure they're coming for us. The days aren't so bad. At least we know that Meat and Mr. Crawler are down there below us in the office. Our protectors, we call them. I asked Father what would happen to them if the Nazis found out they were hiding us. Pim said that they would suffer the same fate that we would. Imagine! They know this. And yet when they come up here, they're always cheerful and gay, as if there were nothing in the world to bother them. Friday, the 21st of August. 1942. Today, I'm going to tell you our general news. Mother is unbearable. Relatable. She insists on treating me like a baby, which I loathe. She hates. Otherwise, things are going better. The weather is... As Han's voice is fading out, the curtain rises on the scene. So here we go into our next scene. Into scene three. Scene three. It is a little after six o'clock in the evening, two months later. Margot is in the bedroom at the right, studying. Mr. Van Don is lying down in the attic room above. The rest of the family is in the main room. Ann and Peter sit opposite each other at the center table where they have been doing their lessons. Mrs. Frank is on the couch. Mrs. Van Don is seated with her fur coat, on which she has been sewing in her lap. None of them are wearing their shoes. Nice. Their eyes are on Mr. Frank, waiting for him to give them the signal which will release them from their day-long quiet. Mr. Frank, his shoes in his hand, stands looking down out of the window at the back watching to be sure that all of the workmen have left the building below. After a few seconds of motionless silence, Mr. Frank turns from the window. It's safe now. The last workman has left. There is an immediate stir of relief. Whee! On. I'm first for the WC. She hurries off to the bathroom. Mrs. Frank puts on her shoes and starts up to the sink to prepare supper. Ann sneaks Peter's shoes from under the table and hides them behind her back. <laughs> Mr. Frank goes into Margot's room. Six o'clock, school's over. Margot gets up, stretching. Ooh, Mr. Sorry. Frank sits down to put on his shoes. In the main room, Peter tries to find his. Have you seen my shoes? Your shoes? You've taken them, haven't you? I don't know what you're talking about. You're going to be sorry. Am I? Oh, Peter goes after her. Ann, with his shoes in her hand, runs from him, dodging behind her mother. Ann, dear. Wait till I get you. I'm waiting. <laughs> Peter makes a lunge for her. They both fall to the floor. Peter pins her down, wrestling with her to get the shoes. Don't! Peter, stop it! Ouch! On! Peter! Sorry, the glitch. Suddenly, Peter becomes self-conscious. He grabs his shoes roughly and starts for his room. Peter, where are you going? Come dance with me. Oh my gosh. Continuing. I tell you, I don't know how. I'll teach you. I'm going to get Mushi his dinner. Can I watch? He doesn't like people around while he eats. Peter, please. No. He goes into his room. Ann slams his door after him. Ann, dear, I think you shouldn't play like that with Peter. Okay. It's not dignified. Who cares if it's dignified? I don't want to be dignified. Mr. I Frank and Margot come from the room on the right. Margot goes to help her mother. Mr. Frank starts for the center table to correct Margot's school papers. 
You complain that I don't treat you like a grown-up, but when I do, you resent it. I only want some fun, someone to laugh and clown with. After you've sat still all day and hardly moved, you've got to have some fun. I don't know what's the matter with that boy. I mean, I'd be going crazy. He isn't too. used to girls. Give him a little time. Time? Is it two months time? Uh, Intent, wink, wink. That means they've been in hiding for two months at this point. I could cry. Come on, Margo. Dance with me. Come on, please. I have to help with supper. You know we're going to forget how to dance. When we get out, we won't remember a thing. She starts to sing and dance by herself. Mr. Frank takes her in his arms, waltzing with her. Oh. Mrs. Van Dyne comes in from the bathroom. Next. Where's Peter? Where would he be? He hasn't finished his lessons, has he? His father will kill him if he catches him in there with that cat and his work not done. Guess he's dead then. Mr. Frank and Arm finish their dance. They bow to each other with extravagant formality. Arm, get him out of there, will you? Peter? Peter? Opening the door a crack. What is it? Your mother says to come out. I'm giving Mushi his dinner. You know what your father says. She sits on the couch, sewing on the lining of her fur coat. Oh, for heaven's sake, I haven't even looked at him since lunch. I'm just telling you, that's all. I'll feed him. I don't want you in there. Peter! <sighs> then give him his dinner and come right out, you hear? He comes back to the table. Anne shuts the door of Peter's room after her and disappears behind the curtain, covering his closet. Now is that any way to talk to your little girlfriend? Mother, for heaven's sake, will you please stop saying that? Look at him blush. Look at him. Please, I'm not... Anyway, let me alone, will you? Way to go, Mom. He acts like it was something to be ashamed of. It's nothing to be ashamed of to have a little girlfriend. You're crazy. She's only 13. So what? And you're 16. Uh. Just perfect. Your father's 10 years older than I am. I warn you, Mr. Frank, if this war lasts much longer, we're going to be related. And then... Mazel tov. And on that awkward note, we'll stop right there. So as a reminder, it was more normal back then, um, you know, for, well, I mean, not for Peter, because he's 16 and she's 13, um, but it was more normal for couples, especially guys, to be older. Um, yeah, so Anne's driving Peter crazy, and then you got Mrs. Van Dan calling him her, calling Anne Peter's little girlfriend. Ugh. Thanks, Ma. All right, to be continued next time. Thanks, guys, for listening in. This is a little bit of a longer stint.